Welcome to the Adventures in CRE audio series. Join Michael Belasco and Spencer Burton as they pull back the curtain on everything commercial real estate and introduce you to some of the top minds in the industry. If you want to take your skills to the next level and be part of a growing community of CRE professionals across the world, this is for you. All right. Welcome back. We are season three. Uh, season three, as you know, was all about deal making, deal doing. And we've had a, uh, a little bit of a lull. We had Thanksgiving break. We're back now. And we're meeting here today with, I don't know, is this my most excited guest of the entire season? It probably is. And for good reason, we're here with Brandon Talman. And before we jump into the um, intro of who Brandon is, um, I have an affinity and a love for the game of baseball. Um, I coached it for several years. My oldest is, I mean, you know, we're, I don't know if we're going to make it to the pros, Brandon, but you know, <laughs> we're, we're trying our hardest to get at least to college, uh, maybe pay for some tuition. Um, but at any rate, um, we've got Brandon Talbot he's got a fantastic background. He is, um, bringing some skills that you might not think are within the scope or the realm of commercial real estate. But we're going to share with you a really cool uh, discussion and chat today with Brandon Taubman. And to maybe before we get a hello from Brandon, if I could just turn a little bit of time over to Spencer just to give me a bio so the listeners have a good you know idea of who Brandon is. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Brandon, it's really good to see you. Now, for the listeners, for the viewers, Brandon actually is also uh, my partner in a real estate investment firm at Stablewood. Uh, and so it, this is... Kind of a double pleasure for me to to, to bring Brandon into the ACRE world. Uh, he and I are in the trenches of of real estate in investing, commercial real estate investing every day. So it's it, that's exciting. Now, in terms of Brandon, he's an investor with 15 years of professional experience across various sectors: investment banking, derivative valuation, uh, daily fantasy sports, which we'll get to, professional sports, and most recently, uh, commercial real estate. He started his career at Ernst and Young, what 2007, Brandon, and then moved to Barclays Investment Bank. Uh, now, simultaneously with his career in finance, he engineered a successful system to wager in daily fantasy sports. And that led to, ironically, a professional career in, in baseball economics. I started with the Houston Astros in early 2013 and was pivotal part in the architecture and rebuilding of the Houston Astros from what, 2013 through 2019. Um, and so Brandon joined Stablewood in early 2020 uh, and it's this really interesting shift from valuing, evaluating and valuing baseball players to evaluating and valuing real estate. And we're, we're going to talk a lot about that. Now, uh, one final uh, connection Brandon and I have, we're both graduates, as is Michael of Cornell University. He currently lives in uh, Southern California with his wife and two kids. So Brandon, great to have you on. Nice to see you again today for, you know second or third time of the day. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. I feel like uh, with a generous introduction like that, anything I can say about myself at this point would be de minimis, but I'll uh, do, do my best to represent myself here. And thank you guys for, for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so to this topic of evaluating baseball players and how that relates to evaluating real estate, um, Give us, give us your mindset as you were making that transition from professional baseball analytics to professional real estate analytics. What did you think about real estate as you were starting that that transition, and how? What, what were the major differences or similarities that you saw at, at the onset? Yeah, uh, great question. So, if you think about it, my career in terms of the industries I've been in. Um, quite fragmented, right? Investment banking to baseball to real estate. But the common thread between the three is that you're ultimately looking at assets that have some projectable value into forward years. And so that's the easiest to understand in finance where you're looking at cash flow and discounting back to present value. In baseball though, players have projections of the sort of value that they'll produce on field. The um, stats community, often called the sabermetric community in baseball, they will look at a, a catch-all metric called WAR, wins above replacement for baseball players. They're basically asking the question, how many wins does this player contribute to my team or how many wins will he contribute to my team in the future? And we can actually assign a, a dollar value to that win production and we can assign a cost of capital to the team. 
And so where you get pretty quickly is a pro forma for a given baseball player that looks not so dissimilar from how you evaluate a derivative or a piece of real estate. Now that's fascinating. So th there's some projection about the value in real estate, the cash flow, right? The, the value that, that 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 player will produce in the coming years. How do you assign um, risk, volatility, right? So in, in real estate, you've got uh, investment grade cash flows and you have some pretty good certainty that those cash flows are going to exist. And then you have other, you know, uh, I, I, let's find a self storage as an example, much more volatile cash flows, actually senior, senior housing even more so because there's a greater expense load. What about volatility with baseball players? Are there certain players that there's more certainty around the, uh, the, the, the cash flow, the performance in the future, or is, they, is there generally more kind of a steady, steady state there? Absolutely. Yeah, there is. So let me stick with the finance baseball real estate framework for explaining sure. this. So in finance, the volatility of any given asset, at least in the liquid markets, is implied by the market, right? So you actually don't need to go study what volatility was, i.e. historic volatility. The market will tell you based on how they're wagering in the marketplace. In baseball, it's not uh, quite as efficient, but it's pretty efficient because what you have is thousands of baseball players over the course of time that have been perfectly tracked in terms of their performance or ups and downs. And it becomes really easy to understand the risk of a given player on a profiling basis. And so to use an example, a left-handed reliever, right, who maybe gets 50 innings pitched a year is going to have uh, a way lower ceiling than a position player that has 700 plate appearance and is impacting the game in, in a lot of different ways. And so the way to understand risk in baseball is to build projection models based on what has happened in the past and pretty clearly and quickly, you can get to an understanding of the sort of different risk in, you know, in athletes. And that uh, connects or correlates with the way that we look at real estate investments, where we have opportunistic and value add and core and core plus and so on. It's least specific in real estate. I think in real estate, we're talking about like broader generalizations of the risk profiles, but we're not often not getting down to the level of you know, standard deviations of risk. I mean, we're trying to, it's stable with, you know that Spencer, but sure. um, I would say, you know, to put a bow on this, the understanding of risk around investments is most sincere and best understood in finance and probably least understood in real estate and baseball is probably in the middle. So I wanted to, to tack on a little bit here. So we're talking about individual assets, so to speak, whether it's, it's, uh, public equities, whether it's uh, a baseball player, whether it's real estate. And we've all seen Moneyball. We all know that if, if you know that if you know the story of Brandon Talman, he's he's of that lineage and maybe even took it to the next level a little bit. So if you're looking at players individually and you're valuing them, there's this there's this aggregation of players that turns into a portfolio of players to which you put on the team. And you're not necessarily going after the player that performs at the highest level on all metrics because you have you have caps you have all kinds of things so give us a little input maybe into the similarities between whether you're putting together a real estate portfolio or a baseball portfolio of players and are there any similarities you can draw there yeah really really good question so um portfolio theory works a little bit differently depending on what industry we're talking about like in the equity space there's not really a, a cap on the amount of transaction that you can do. And the market is like really liquid. So the math will basically tell you what the most optimal portfolio is. In baseball, it's a little bit different, right? Because you have all these roster constraints and you can't have a given player play more than one position and not every player can play every position. In fact, they're often usually like relegated or uh, restricted to a couple positions that they could play well. So there's a lot more, um, thought or curation that goes into like putting together a good baseball team, the closer you are to the major league level, right? The more specific you need to be about how you put together a roster, right? Like typically pitching staffs are 12 or 13 players. You know, you don't want more than one first baseman on your team, right? Because that causes a little bit more friction with your, your roster and so on and so forth. Um, but the lower level you get, the closer you get to the amateur draft or the international market, where you have like five, six, seven years to develop players, the less you really care about those sorts of restrictions, like what position does a player want? And really what you want to do is just get the best players that you can. The rate of attrition is so high for minor league players, something in the order of 90%. So you're just 
focused on the best players. It doesn't really matter if you get 10 shortstops and you're playing those shortstops out of position because really you're just looking for like some golden nugget, some skill that can ride that yeah. wave of attrition all the way from the Dominican Summer League to the Major League level. So, so definitely depends almost, about what sort of portfolio you're talking about, major or minor league. Yeah, so it's almost like you develop your internal market almost. Like you don't really care. You're just bringing in all the all the players and then you start to curate that and you get to select. So I under, I, I, I'm just peeking into this really for the first time how – major league teams then sort of cultivate their in-house sort of private markets of players yeah. that they can then start to analyze. Yeah, like you rarely, a major league team will rarely have ever have like two really good shortstops on the cusp of a major league promotion and they have to figure out like how to position those players on their team. Most teams have none, right? And they're spending $100 million in the free agent market to have a suitable shortstop. But it's nice to not be like prescriptive on portfolio uh, assemblage, if you will as a scouting director or international director where like you're just trying to find some talent. So I, I want to jump in here just for a minute. We're about, you know, we're 10 minutes into the interview or, or you know, and, and Spencer and Michael and Brandon, you guys know each other. And so you, we jumped into the weeds really quick. And I'm wondering for my own benefit, I don't know if the listeners feel this way, but for my own benefit, I'm wondering like, I, I know what I, I love the game of baseball. I love the strategy. I'll sit down and watch a game of baseball and, I'll have siblings or people or friends that are like, this is boring. I don't get this. Like, I don't see what's happening. And I'm like, there's so much strategy here. You don't know what's going on. But I, I want to just go back a little bit. And we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to put like a little bit of a backdrop on what, because what you're really talking about is a high level tactical skill that you are applying to something that will make a lot of money and like, so you you have some awesome skills, but I need a framework. Where did Brand like? Did you love baseball first? Did you say, "Hey, I really love math, and I'm going to go into finance"? And then baseball was like, "How did this happen?" And I know, and I have a a, a piggyback question to that. Um, well, let's start there. I have a piggyback question. If it works, then it works. But start with me. Like, where did this love and fascination for? I don't even know what we're calling this. Where did that start? I think with my mom and dad, and maybe with my grandpa, who took my dad to Shea Stadium when it first opened, um, you know, many years ago, my dad became a okay. big fan. And so just like you, Sam, when I grew up, like my dad coached my Little League team, he took me to ball games, and I think uh, I grew into a love for baseball. And uh, my professional career took me in a different direction, right? I was much like a lot of the listeners of this podcast, interested in building uh, a career for myself in corporate finance. And that's exactly the direction that I went in out of school with Ernst & Young and then Barclays. And those were really good experiences. I worked with really smart people. I learned a lot about the way the world works, but I became uh, somewhat disenchanted because I had seen some some problematic things in my time in finance. I saw the, the subprime mortgage crisis and the global financial crisis when I first graduated in 2007. And my position at Ernst & Young was to value or evaluate these derivatives that investment banks and insurance companies held that were at the core of the crisis itself. Moved on to Barclays, again, like very thankful my, for my experiences there, but gained some insights that made me feel like, you know what, there's, there's more to experience outside of uh, corporate America. And, yeah. um, you know, that sort of interest or intrigue that I had about maybe going to work for a professional sports team coincided with the birth of this new um, called like wagering platform, uh, gambling market, if you will, which was Daily Fantasy Sports. Now, Daily Fantasy Sports is a daily contest. It starts and ends in the same day where you create a roster of players and those players have some cost and some projected value or some projected production. And you can play against big pools of people. You could play head to head and so on and so forth. And so in its infancy, Daily fantasy sports was very inefficient. There were a lot of, um, say, let's say, sports fans or enthusiasts that didn't really have a systematic or, or quantitative approach to playing, and, and I did. And so, you know, I built a, a projection system and an optimizer in Excel using Solver. You guys can see uh, Spencer Burden's Solver tutorial online at ACRE if you like. But um, <laughs> I, I, used, I used the same tool, and um, I basically picked the optimal roster each day. I played in scale. I won a whole bunch. Um, and I sort of like marketed that. Uh, I'm like smiling ear to ear right now. Just, and I'm, I should put, I'll put myself on mute, but I'm like hearing this story 
And I'm like, oh, this is like the coolest thing ever. Guy yeah. comes from <laughs> finance, working on, you know, formulas and all this stuff, takes it, starts. So make sure you include in your in your story how much money you were making. Um, just the fantasy <laughs> football stuff. I'm just kidding. Uh, but sorry to interrupt you. But if you're just listening, all three of us that are listening, we're all smiling, just being like, this is incredible. So Brandon, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. Uh, appreciate it. Unfortunately, I didn't make as much money uh, as I wish I as I wish I did or could have, I guess, because I forewent that opportunity for uh, something in baseball. And obviously, there's a conflict of interest. So as soon as I got hired by the Astros, I stopped my daily fantasy uh, activities. But it was did actually they find you because of that. So or the, did you? The, yeah, the story yeah. there is I was interested in learning what the impact of weather was on the run environment. Basically, I wanted to know like how much <laughs> weather impacts how many runs are scored in a given game. Turns out the, the impact is pretty significant. But in any case, I, I put together some research. I imported data from Bloomberg, my Bloomberg terminal at work at Barclays had access to weather data. And I built this, <laughs> this model that basically tried to predict what the change in expected run environment or, or run outcome would be given wind, wind direction, precipitation, et cetera. And I shared it with an individual at the Cardinals who I just had reached out to. And I was like, have you guys looked at anything like this? Um, how do you guys handle this, et cetera? And started a conversation um, with this guy who eventually recommended that I apply for a job at the Houston Astros that I just opened. He had some friends there as well. Um, and so I would say it was sort of serendipitous or I don't want to call it an accidental, but um, I was yeah. primarily interested in making money from daily and that sort of naturally or organically grew into an opportunity with the major league team. And then by the way, when I saw the opportunity with the Astros at the time, the team was winning 50 games a year. It had no TV deal in place, which is how clubs get like half of their revenue to go spend on players. And we had the worst farm system in baseball, 30th rank of 30 teams, according to all the third parties that are really good at understanding the quality of your farm system. So my friends and family were like, what are you doing? You're going to move to Houston, Texas, a place you, a state you've never <laughs> stepped into in your entire life for a baseball team that looks absolutely atrocious right now. You're going to make like 30% of the amount of money that you're making now. And like, ask your, your girlfriend, who's now my wife, to move across the country with you. And I was like, yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm going to do. But I got to say, the people that were uh, starting the organization, the baseball operations effort, like... They were a really impressive group that had had a tremendous amount of success at the Cardinals building up their draft process. And so I had some confidence that things were going to work out well and that I would have a great team around me to work with and hopefully prosper. Okay. So let, let me ask you, um, yeah. 2013 to 2019, you had some great success at, at the Astros. Uh, I'll toot your horn for you. Um, but what changed in, in the way that baseball players were analyzed from 2013 to 2019, both at the Astros, it's, and it sounds like there were some significant changes at the Astros, but across the major league in, in, in general, what changed over those six years? Yeah, really good question. So I'm going to take it back a little bit farther, right? Because a lot of people have this uh, money ball revolution as their reference point for baseball analytics. And that was early 2000s, right? So Billy Bean and Paul DePodesta played by Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill in um, the... Uh, forgetting the author's name. Um, but, but in any case, so what they decided to do is like, okay, let's look at how players have performed historically and see if we can understand what that means about how they will perform in the future. It's a basic, basic premise, right? And they had data at their fingertips to do that. The next sort of uh, phase in baseball analytics came at the St. Louis Cardinals where Jeff Luno, Sig Meidel, this group of guys decided like, hey, what if we took the same sort of approach in the amateur draft market, right? So high school and college kids, JUCO kids, and let's uh, see if we could produce a draft model that will lead to outsized returns in the draft. And that worked brilliantly. And so the Cardinals had like all of this success with homegrown talent in the late 2000s that was predicated on, the, on how they were drafting and their analytical approach there. So at the Astros, you know, management embraced those concepts, like let's use data to draft well and to evaluate players well. But you know, the big unlock, the big opportunity at the Astros was we stopped looking at data, past data as a way of projecting the future. And what we said is like, what happens if we actually empower our players and our coaches with data, right? So instead of like management using it to make personnel decisions, let's actually share this information with our players so that we can help them be the best versions of themselves. 
And that was the analytical revolution of the Astros. We really like unlock pitching. If you look at our resume in terms of how we've drafted and developed pitching, who we've signed and how they've performed compared to expectations, it's very clear, like we got the most out of our pitchers. And we were able to do that because of a technology in baseball that tracks every pitch thrown and expresses those pitches thrown in spin rate, velocity, break, pitch location, and so on. And using that data, you can really understand like, man, this pitcher over here, for example, he throws his fastball 40% of the time. That's not a good pitch. He has a curveball that's one of the best pitches in baseball that he throws 5% of the time. Let's ask him to throw his curveball some more and his fastball less. And like those sorts of tactical changes made a big difference in terms of win production. And the players bought in because we were talking their language now, right? We weren't saying, hey, you're projected to be a three war player next year. We're saying, this is how your fastball spins and where it's located. And here's the data. So, so on, on with every decision, there's a, there's a call it a risk adjusted return calculation, right? Um, players may perform well, real estate may perform well, but it also costs a lot. H how, in baseball, how did you kind of pair the cost of a player versus your ex the expected outcome from that player? Yeah, great question. We took um, like a stochastic model approach, a probabilistic model, which Spencer and, and Michael, I see you guys laughing because you, you know what that means. But basically, we uh, would understand risk by simulating the returns of baseball players over the course of time and was really fortunate for clubs and unfortunate for players, for major league players, is that for the first six years of their service at the major league level, they're basically on a string of successive options. So each year the club gets to decide whether to keep, retain the player or to let him go. And so like the risk to the major league club of their minor league talent and of players in their first six years is relatively small. Where the risk comes in is with deals in free agency, where players get long-term multi-year deals. And we would basically simulate the risk around those free agency decisions to understand whether they were worthwhile and where that analysis pushed us is basically like always try to focus on keeping a core group of controllable, relatively cheap players and don't try to build an organization around free agency. I mean, some clubs are able to do that successfully, like the Yankees, for example, because their expenditures are like unlimited. They can do what they want, but for a team that really does care about risk right? The risk of a player going bust. Like we would just focus on young controllable talent, best mitigant. Fascinating. I mean, so, I think about all these parallels to real estate and something that you and I have talked about in the past, and that is coaching by via data rather than intuition. How has that changed? Right? So you think about your traditional coach from 50 years ago and, and he's got this beer belly and he's making decisions on the fly because because he's coached a thousand games or 2000 games. How has that changed today? How much, how much influence does data have on the actual decisions coaches are making? It's changed dramatically, but I wonder if it's actually gone too far in some ways. And so like the two diametrically opposed viewpoints, one is like coaches are prone to making bad decisions. They'll make the decisions that stay, save their stomach lining and not the ones that like maximize output. Like they're not really good at gauging risk basically in terms of how they make in-game decisions. The other one is that the coach is wise, understands the players, sees and feels things in the dugout that people upstairs in their ivory tower in the front office can't possibly understand. Where the industry currently is, is like way more skewed to the former, where teams are basically asking their coaches to make programmatic decisions in-game. But um, there's a lot of stories, a lot of anecdotes in recent time where like maybe that's led teams astray in their in-game decision-making. At the Astros, we too were, were skewed towards this sort of programmatic approach. I think rules of thumb are appropriate, that there ought to be a dialogue between the front office and the coach where they're explaining like what the risk is and the likely outcome for various decisions that could be made throughout the game, but that you still give the coach the flexibility and the power to make decisions that he thinks is, are best given what he knows of the players on any given day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the parallel of real estate, if you think about it, and, and this is a constant, uh, a constant tension at Stablewood where, um, we value data, we value technology to a degree, I think more than many firms in the industry, but traditionally, right. This is an industry where real estate decisions are made largely on intuition. And then oftentimes the analysis is meant to support the intuition and not the other way around. Um, 
but it can go too far, right? Where you rely too much on the, the data, you rely too much on the analysis and, and, and you need a nice, healthy pairing of, of the two. Michael, it's interesting. I'll, and I'll let you chime in on this, but M Michael uh, is a bit more of a skeptic. I'm sorry if I'm putting words in Michael's mouth, a bit more of a skeptic <laughs> around the value of, of data and real estate and, and at that value compared to the intuition Thought, thoughts on, on this conundrum right now in the industry, data versus intuition. Are you asking me that or asking Michael Velasco? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would not say that I'm a skeptic at all. I would say there is a level of skepticism that I've always kept. And I think, you know, for the listeners, you know, I was, um, a part of Stablewood during the launch for the first year and a half. And this would always be a point of contention because, and this is something there's, there's a lot to unpack here, first of all, because I've been, um, thinking about. Ask, I'm going to ask Brandon the question about bridging the gap between other industries. It's something that we we talk about a lot and how much value add that is. But back to your question. So um, I'm not skeptical of data at all. Uh, I And I always told Brandon when we talked, I just want to challenge it to the point of finding where it breaks down, you know, and it's true. You get into data and you get in, there, there's a lot of truth to data and there's a lot of field of data. And I find that when you get down deep into the weeds, it ultimately comes down to the assumption that you put into a future predictor, you know, and whether you're predicting it at the top level and you're saying 3% or you're using all this data to get to the, the bottom detail to say that you're predicting on a street level X or Y, there's always some input that is an intuition that is better informed by data. And I've had so many conversations with brand and that in the initial, you know, Rent always goes up by 3%, whether it's up or down. If you're a long-term investor, who, who cares? You know, it's always going <laughs> to hit that mark. And we got to the point to where like, you know, I value it. And it's funny because since I've left Stablewood, there's a couple of things I've started and like data is can't, like I can't get past it. I've learned through Brandon to be constantly asking questions to where it's bulletproof using, using whatever data is there to support it. That is never going to be the full answer to everything, but it better informs. And the other thing I've noticed is that it's more convincing when you're going out. So you're, you're investing money and you're raising money. And data is very helpful in convincing other sophisticated people that you know what you're doing because you have this extra resource and this extra power. So I am not a skeptic of data. I just want to get down to the point. And my role there was to basically say, I'm skeptical until proven otherwise and going all the way down in the details now. I Brandon, yeah, I think it's healthy time. though, by the way, uh, I, I appreciate, and, and skepticism is probably a bit, um, uh, extreme. I, you, you question it. And I think questioning is important. Um, uh, now, I, yeah. I just want to add. So when Brandon came and I, every time Spencer, you and I speak to universities, Brandon Talman, whether it's directly or indirectly is a subject of one of my main messages. And it's because of all this and what he's brought into Stablewood and how, like what he's done, which to him was no brainers. And to us was like revolutionary, like the things he contributed. And it was because he came from an, well, first of all, he's brilliant. So that's the first thing you need to have a brilliant mind. I know Brandon. You're going to do this more brilliant. often, guys. My ego is, is, is <laughs> well measured. But you cross industries, right? So Brandon came from this, Brandon came from Wall Street, came from baseball. And he, he had, he, he was very data centric. And he comes into real estate now and he's bringing in things. I remember when we were on calls in the early days and he'd mention stuff be like, guys, why aren't we doing X? And we'd all be like, okay, we'll prove it. And then like the next day he'd come up and he'd prove it. And we would like, mind's blown. It happened many times. And so I always tell people, if you're starting a company and you want to do real estate, for example, bring in a brilliant mind who might be interested. That's coming from something completely different because if you're trained in an industry, you're trained to see things a certain way. And when somebody comes in from outside that has the ability to think critically, they're going to bring some revolutionary, uh, revolutionary ideas to which Brandon Talman has done over and over again. I've seen it, um, which brings me to my question, Brandon, I've been wanting to ask you. So, Wait, can I just say, I want to say something really quickly, I, I'm piggybacking on your remarks there and Spencer, like the best organizations have a Michael Velasco and a Brandon Talman. I hope that doesn't sound too conceited to say that that way, but my point is like there's balance, right? And so all the times that Michael like shot holes in whatever I was presenting was really valuable because it made the end result better. I think so-so organizations have like only people like me or only people like Velasco where you have like really strong subject matter expertise in this case, real estate and Velasco coming from Heinz, me coming from data science. 
and the worst organizations have neither. But but I do think you need like checks and balances. It goes back to your question about manager and team and so on. And so, yeah, to any people forming companies or, or looking to hire in skill sets, there is true value to wisdom of, of the crowds where you want uh, disparate viewpoints and to achieve balance in the end. Go ahead, Velasco. Yeah, so um, that's, that's a super great point. So what I wanted to ask you was, you've seen the revolution of baseball and how you pick players and you curate teams. You've watched it from inside. And then you come to an industry, which is for all intents and purposes, sort of nascent in the data and analytics space. There's a lot being done here, but it's not that much, right? It's not that much compared to what you've seen in baseball. So from the transition, when you transitioned from baseball to commercial real estate and you took a peek under the hood at how people do things in real estate and to what you've started to do now and what you've been implementing over these past couple of years at Stablewood, where would you say, and you've interacted with a lot of different capital partners, lenders, equity, you've interacted with tons of people. So you, you know, you're, you're well in the thick of the industry more so than, than most. Where would you say real estate analytics data underwriting is compared to other industries you've been in? And, and maybe this is a little too in the weeds, but where do you see it going or where do you see opportunities for it to improve? If you can answer, I know some of that might be proprietary for you, but to the extent you can answer that, would be great. Yeah. So first part is I would say real estate is truly in the stone ages. Uh, honestly, I mean, part of that is because um, in finance, you have literally millions of participants in the marketplace that make it efficient and observable. In baseball, you have like this pristine track record. Every pitch is thrown, every at bat is, is tracked. And that gives people like me like wonderful data to work with. In real estate, there's very little data, relatively speaking, and it's highly fragmented. Like even if it's out there, it's hard to get your hands on it. And so to answer your second part of your question, in real estate, I think the barriers to entry to do good data science are way higher because the data is worse and more incomplete and so on. But also because of that, like the benchmarks are way lower. Like there's a lot of opportunities like do better than what's out there. Um, and that's why I basically got into the industry because I thought that there was, uh, I wanted to be part of this, this ride up. And I think real estate is going to change a lot over the next 10 years. Let's say you see all mm -hmm. these, uh, service providers with their SaaS plays coming into the space and you see data vendors offering interesting data sets that can help you understand investment opportunities better. And I'm excited to be yeah. a part of, uh, applying the emergence of new data in real estate. So I want to go back for, it's kind of my job to go back every now and again, you know what I mean? Um, I want to go back because I think, and one of the things that Spencer and I, since we were kids that we love to do is just like, look at businesses, consider businesses, you know, think strategically, all that kind of stuff. And I try and, I try and find these, these principles to attach my reasoning through. And the, the samurai, not to get too samurai on you, but Maimoto Musashi, if you've ever heard that name, he was like a grand poobah of the, of the samurai. He said, if you know the way broadly, you will see it in everything, right? And one of the principles that we think about that, that I use as kind of a, a mechanism is think macro, act micro. Meaning if you see success and if you, if you see patterns broadly, then you can create leverage by acting in small things, right? And th that's that's my own personal kind of principle or whatever. I, I don't I don't want to put words in your mouth as I'm sitting sitting here like listening to your story, listening your to your tactics and how you're doing things. I'm very curious as to okay, you go from finance to baseball to real estate, and I'm thinking, well, you've seen the way broadly in at least in finance and then you saw it in in baseball because of that are you able to see it in everything and that applies obviously to what you do now in commercial real estate that's i guess that's my question yeah it's good um i'm going to struggle through this answer a little bit but i'm going to try try my best here i struggled through the question so it's it's fair game buddy <laughs> I, I think the uh the macro principle is that data compared combined with subject matter expertise leads to the best decisions. That's okay. the macro. That's what I've seen throughout all industries. Now in real estate, the micro is that it's basically all gut feel right now, right? So 
there's like a whole bunch of micro opportunities to seize and we're doing our best to seize them at, at Stablewood. But, you know, think about a traditional acquisitions person that is, you know, like largely basing, uh, well, they're doing underwriting for sure, especially if they're part of the ACRE accelerator program, but um, they're also visiting sites and, um, you know, like forming an opinion subjectively with very little data on hand. And that's not the way that is optimal, probably, and at least not the way that we're approaching it at Stablewood, where we're trying to first apply as much data as we can to understand the investability of the property. And then the subject matter expert is there to like fill in the gaps, right? Like where, where is the data not so sharp or not so complete where we'd be foolish to rely on it? And let's have our people focus their expertise in those areas. Talk to us a little bit about um, a phrase I hear you use a lot, discount, but don't dismiss. Where did that come from and how does that relate in your view to, to real estate? So um, a gentleman named Sig Meidel, who's currently the assistant general manager of the Baltimore Orioles, always used that expression and stuck with me. And where it comes from is in the draft room, at least at the Astros, you have this weird dynamic where on one side of the room, you had all the nerdy front office people using their projection systems to understand how good the draft were. And then you had the scouts that were out in the field looking at these players, follow, following them all throughout the, the draft calendar year. And um, often there'd be a player with a projection, a projected value that would exceed his likely draft positioning, right? But there's always something wrong with that sort of player, right? Like Tyler White is a great example. This guy coming out of his D2 program was like 350 pounds, like severely overweight. He could only play first base, but like he hit, right? And so the scouts were like, this guy's like never going to be a star. Let's not, it's not like he can't possibly be. But six point was like, well, let's discount him for the fact that he's got a bad, bad body and he's slow and this and that, but let's not outright dismiss him because he does have some attractive attributes that may pan out. Now, Tyler White never became an all-star type player, but he did by far exceed expectations. And he was an important part of the Astros for a few years as a bat, as a guy who we could just put in the lineup and would, would get us a hit when we needed it. So that's where that mantra comes from. And it's uh, just this idea that like, we don't know the future well enough to outright dismiss. What we need to do is be calculated in the way that we assign premiums and discounts to a given investment opportunity, whether it's real estate or, or a baseball player. Yeah, I love that. So we don't have a lot more time and I wanna make sure to speak to the younger members of our audience. Um, there's two really areas. First off, you, you had this fascinating transition from a, one industry to a totally different industry, and you've been able to, to add such significant value to real estate already. And, and I'm excited about, you know, the, the coming years, but um, what about to say a university student, undergrad, grad student, they're trying to build up their skill set so that they can add value to the industry as it changes and, and it adapts some of these micro uh, opportunities that you mentioned. Uh, what technical skills besides real estate financial modeling, of course, can they be, can they be focusing on? I mean, you've mentioned R, I know that's a language. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are, are there tools like that, that undergrads should really be mastering in order to, to excel in real estate? Yeah. Okay. Be very specific about it. I think yeah. all of your listeners who have an interest in building technical skills to be more, more marketable and better investors should actually get into Python. I've gotten into R because at some point R was bigger than Python in terms of its like open source community. But the way that the world is going, it's like Python is the language to focus on. It's the most flexible, it's all open source. And so to have some basic proficiencies there that you could put on your resume, like that would be huge. I remember when I started at Ernst & Young in 2007, the fact that I could create some VBA macros was like a big deal to like managers. And it like put me ahead of the other people that were starting my year, right? The modern day like Excel modeling VBA skill is Python. If you have that skill set, you'll be more attractive to hiring managers in, in forthcoming years. And um, there's so much that you can do in Python, machine learning, some software development, you do some data engineering there, like, but just pick up some basic skill sets. It will go a long way and put you uh, ahead of the, the peer group, I think. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. That's awesome. Uh, Michael, any last words from you, buddy? Um, other than that, this has been an incredible episode. I'm excited for everybody to hear this. Um, I think the big takeaway for me and I've, I've, this is from Brandon and that I constantly tell pretty much everybody I speak to, uh, at the university level and beyond is, um, you know, look beyond 
where you are in the industry and look outside and you'll be pleasantly surprised. I think that's the way to make revolutions happen uh, in industry. So that's my that's my constant go to with Brandon. So there's there's so much more. But, yeah, it's been a pleasure and always love listening and talking to Brandon. So it's been great. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you. Yeah. Same time and place next week, guys. There we go. Same time, yeah, same place. This Brandon. Week after week, and it'd be interesting, no doubt. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Brandon, you've been fantastic. Thanks for coming and sharing um, all this nerdy stuff, as well as all the other really interesting insights. Uh, I, t I, I kid. Um, it's been great for me. I love hearing your story. Um, I think the listeners will obviously enjoy just the transition. And I think the other thing it does is it makes it so, hey, you don't have to be stuck in the mud. You are other things. You can transition. You can, you know, um, develop other skill sets that will give you other opportunities. So um, maybe that's a undertone of, of the interview. So thanks for coming uh, to the listeners. Thanks for listening. Or if you're watching, thanks for watching. And we'll see you on the next episode of this podcast. I will say that Brandon's information and write-up will be uh, on our website at adventuresincre.com. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Adventures in CRE audio series. For show notes and additional resources, head over to www.adventuresincre.com slash audio series. Would you like to learn real estate financial modeling in a matter of weeks and do it with zero guesswork? If so, the ACRE Accelerator is for you. The Accelerator is a step-by-step case-based program designed to teach you exactly what you need to know and in the order you need to know it, so you can gain both the knowledge and experience to take your career to the next level. To see if the Accelerator is right for you, go to www.adventuresincre.com accelerator.